Welcome everybody to the fifth IGC events webinar focus on geothermal, which is presented by Think Geoenergy and EnerChange. My name is Jochen Schneider. I'm the director of EnerChange and glad to welcome you and Robert Winslow, executive vice president at EVA Technologies. Shortly about the frame of the focus on geothermal, the webinar is recorded and you can follow up next week on the EnerChange YouTube channel. Please follow us also on LinkedIn and Twitter with likes and comments. You're all invited to comment and ask questions related to the slides in the chat, also during the presentation. I will pick them up and discuss with Robert so that we ha will have a discussion already during his presentation. For the next webinars, we will offer also exclusive co-host possibilities so that you can participate actively in the discussion. But let's get started with today's webinar, a progress update on EVERS closed loop system and their upcoming geothermal project in Garrett Street. For this presentation, we welcome Robert Winslow. He has nearly 40 years international business development experiences, sales, marketing and management in the energy industry. Graduating with a degree in mechanical engineering, he lived and worked in Indonesia, Australia and India for Schlumberg. Returning to Europe, he joined IBM before going on to build and manage international sales and marketing organizations for Halliburton and IHS, as well as personally closing multi-million dollar energy related contracts across Europe, Asia, and Africa and North and South America. He advised Chinese state companies on strategic gas development and has been frequent consultant to the World Bank on projects ranging from energy planning in Angola to infrastructure development and capacity building in Mauritania. Since 2018, he is executive vice president at Ever Technologies Incorporation, the winner of this year's Ruggiero Bertani Award. Robert, the floor is yours. Jochen, thank you. Thank you so much for the, uh, the introduction and for the, uh, the opportunity. Um, I will um, uh, move on uh, straight away so that uh, we can get through to the, uh, the questions. I'm going to, as Jochen said, I'm going to talk um, a little bit about the company, uh, the background, the project that we did in Canada last year, and then go on to talk about the, the upcoming project in uh, Garrett Street in Germany, um, and also a little bit about, about our vision for the, uh, the region of Bavaria and, uh, and Germany as a, as a whole. Uh, but as you said, as we go through this, I'm more than happy to take uh, questions as we go along. Um, if something is, is unclear or you have a particular interest on a particular point or slide that uh, that we're making. So with that, um, let's let's move on. The first thing I'd like to do is just give you a quick bit of background on the uh, on the, on the company because we are a, a relatively young company um, in the sense that we've been around since 2017. Uh, but as as Jochen pointed out, uh, my career in the oil and gas industry goes back to, to 1980. Um, and as with many of my colleagues, we have a really strong background in, in oil and gas. Um, what we have done also though, is, is we've added uh, some experts and advisors who come from the, the geothermal sector, some of, some of them whom you will, you will know very well. Um, the first uh, couple of years were spent uh, looking at this, this crazy idea of a, a closed loop system. Um, and the more we thought about it and the more people we spoke to about it, uh, the more we learned that the idea wasn't going to work. Um, and so the more encouraged we were that actually maybe we were onto something uh, very special. Um, it got to the point where though that uh, people were really struggling with the, the concept of the closed loop. So we said, okay, well, we'll go and build one and prove that it works. So last year in 2019, we did exactly that. We built um, a field, a full field size uh, system 
uh, and I'll talk about that in a, in a, uh, in a moment. It's, it's uh, working beautifully and has, um, has, um, we've achieved all of the objectives uh, we've set. What we're in the process of doing now is looking at the organization of the technology. And we have identified a whole series of uh, projects around the world. Uh, we believe the first of those um, will take place in, in Gerritsried uh, in Germany. So what is, what is this system? Robert, How is it different? Um, yep. Robert, just, just the first question. Um, this this Everlight uh, system in, in Canada that you built, how, how is it financed? What is the financing structure of Ever? Yes, we 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 can uh, we'll talk about that. The the Everlight system uh, we built for uh, 10 million uh, Canadian dollars. Uh, 8.9 million of that came from grants from the the Canadian government, and the balance came from the uh, the shareholders uh, within the within the company. Thanks. Okay. So let's. Um, the next point I wanted to talk about just very briefly is, is to talk about uh, the different types of uh, geothermal and how, how is Everloop different. As a, as a closed loop system, um, we have a working fluid. We're not interacting with the rev reservoir um, other than to extract the heat. So we're not looking for a permeable aquifer. Um, we're going down with cold, dense fluid, uh, primarily coming back as a lighter warmer fluid and because of this we get a thermosiphon effect and so once it's going there is no parasitic pump load involved um, obviously there's there's no fracking or induced seismicity no co2 or greenhouse gas emissions there's no water use no brine production um, and as as with all geothermal systems it can operate in both base load mode but one of the things that makes uh, this evolute system truly unique is is the ability to act as a dispatchable power source to act in a load following mode which which we'll talk about in a second so looking at some of the the characteristics of the evolute itself in more detail um, obviously we're coming off um, single and then going out into multilaterals uh, we're sealing this these horizontal sections uh, with our own technology called rock pipe so this allows us to drill and seal the horizontal sections without without casing so that was one of the things we wanted to, to test on the light um, we then have the, the ranging technology which allows us to um, have two wells coming from different uh, directions and intersecting uh, with each other the footprint on surface is is obviously relatively small because we don't have the water handling facilities uh, deal with uh, that would be associated in a, in a traditional um, system but if you're going to produce power you still need the ORC systems or the heat exchangers for uh, the heating grid and then the, the other point here again is we, we're going to talk about dispatchability but also resilience um, is, is extremely important I mean it, it's a system that exists below ground it can be built almost anywhere it can be built um, as, as a supplement to existing grid systems, so it offers resiliency in, in, in the light of or in the event of a, a disaster or a breakdown in uh, grid power. I now want to talk about uh, Eblight and the implementation that we, we did in Canada. Um, what we did here, we had two drilling rigs operating simultaneously, uh, two and a half kilometers apart, about uh, two and a half kilometers deep um, and then we drilled two verticals uh, drilled and cased the two verticals down through the intermediate casing point and then drill, drilled and completed two open hole uh, lateral sections um, this is probably a more accurate picture of, of the way the way it went so we were targeting a, a sandstone a crystalline sandstone that was 50 around 15 meters thick and we were, uh, wanted to stay within that uh, so the two drilling rigs operating simultaneously, you could stand on one and see the other one in the, in the distance. Um, the intersection 
of the of the laterals was, was was made on September the first, and then we set about building the surface facilities, um, getting the fluid charged inside the system, and then switching to thermosiphon mode. So here you you see when the emergency shut down on the system, uh, we closed the pump that was used to um, push the fluid into the, to charge the system in the first place, switched the, the pump off, opened the valves, and the system started to flow by itself under thermosiphon. And it's been flowing under thermosiphon now for the last uh, seven months. The other thing that obviously we've been doing is looking at the thermal output of the system and comparing that with the original models. Um, and it is, it, it's almost a perfect match. So within about 2% of the, the thermodynamic models uh, that, that were predicted. So we feel that a lot of the, the, the questions that were raised about the technology have been answered um, through, this, uh, through the Everlight system and has given us a basis to, to go on and start looking at the commercial systems. But there are a couple of other really important lessons that, that came from Everlight. The first one was in terms of the predictability of the, of the costs. So we have the, the cost curves and these, these matched um, almost perfectly. So we, we came on, came in uh, within time and also within, within budget, which was, was very encouraging. The second thing is we, we know that we can leverage the reducing costs that are coming from the oil and gas sector, where long reach horizontal wells are now being drilled and completed you know, in, in eight and a half days. So this is based on data from precision drilling and from other companies across hundreds, if not thousands of wells, uh, where the drilling time for uh, completing uh, horizontal wells has, has come down dramatically. The other one that I want to talk about I mentioned earlier was uh, dispatchability. Um, and if you just focus on this, this graph here on the top left hand uh, corner, you think about um, uh, geothermal with this orange line, two and a half megawatt capacity, operating a flat output 24 hours a day. So that's, that's going to deliver you about 60 megawatt hours over a 24 hour period. But the thing about the Everloop system, you have the ability to actually deliver those 60 megawatt hours in almost any shape you want. So you can reduce the flow rate. And as you reduce the flow rate through the system, the water in the system heats up. You can open the valves and flow it out more quickly to generate more heat than the, over a shorter period than the base, the name, the, the, the nameplate capacity. So you've got the ability to hit peak loads and to follow a, a particular demand curve. So if you take you know, a typical base load um, on a network, you may have a peak of wind or solar. And so what you need, and then you have the total demand curve, what you can do with the Everloop systems is basically fill in the gap. If you're generating electricity, of course, you, you have to over-engineer the ORC system slightly to uh, meet the, the peak demand, um, but it gives you tremendous flexibility in the way that you use the, the 60 megawatt hours that are available from the from the system. So now uh, I'd like to um, just sort of finish off this this piece by talking about you know what that means in terms of uh, energy categories, and if you think about baseload power and clean and scalable. Everloop fits all of those categories, but it also offers something in addition to that. It's effectively can act as, a, as a, an earth battery in dispatchable mode. It's also resilient. It's also black start capable uh, in the sense that it can switch off, switch back on um, almost instantaneously without any additional power source to, to get it going. Jochen, any any questions on all of that, or should we move on to? to talk well, about well, there are that there are some questions uh, in in general, but but not what what you just showed at the end. Um, there is one question about the is is the rock pipe technology confined to particular rock types? Uh, for example, no, not. Or can it no, be? No, not at all. 
sedimentary basins too coming from a whole integrity viewpoint? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've focused um, where we've tested it and where, where we know that it works um, is certainly in sedimentary basins. Um, it's, it certainly works best in, um, in sandstones, dolomites. Um, it's, uh, we haven't tested it extensively in shales uh, yet, um, but in sedimentary basins, certainly. Um, and we also expect it to, to work in harder rocks as well. So, so in the end, you're not planning to go to the granite. Well, that's that's a, a question for uh, for another time. It's certainly uh, it's certainly an interest of ours, uh, but at the moment, no, we're focusing on the on the sedimentary layers. Okay, and then there is another question. Your model is two kilometer depth, uh, about 60 degrees, assuming a typical geothermal gradient. Are there minimum depth requirements for this system? No, um, it's it's really a question of what you're trying to do with the heat on surface. So if you if you have a, a heating network with an inlet temperature of 70 and outlet temperature of 40, which a, a modern heating network would have, then you know, we're looking for downhole temperatures of maybe 110, 120. And in in some places we're looking in in, uh, at in in Japan where the you know the temperature gradient is 120, 130 degrees per kilometer. So we're not going to have to go very deep to to get that sort of heat. Of course, if you want to generate electricity, then you know the hotter the better up to a, a certain point. Um, so no, we, we are certainly interested in higher temperature areas uh, so that we don't have to, to drill as deep to, to find the heat we're looking for. And another question is, does changing the flow rate impact the natural circulation without pumps in the pipe? So yeah, we have, um, there is a natural um, uh, thermosiphon effect uh, and we can play with the, the flow rates up to a certain point. If we if we want to increase the flow rates beyond that, the natural thermosiphon effect, then yes, a pump load would be necessary. But all of the applications we're we're looking at, and certainly the application in Garrett Sreed, we don't envision needing any sort of uh, pump load. Um, but it's it's a really good, it's a really interesting question about the flow rates, because um, one of the questions we are, often get asked is, well, surely the rock is going to cool down over time. Closed loop systems don't work. And of course, um, the rock can cool down. But if you think about it, if you think about the fluid inside the system, and it takes about eight hours for a water molecule to transit through the system, if the water isn't flowing, then the water is just gathering heat. It's not cooling anything down. Um, and so the cooling effect is really depends on the flow rate. So what you do is you adjust the flow rates to ensure you have either a constant output over a 30 year period, or you produce the fluid at a, a more at a peak rate, and you see the rock cool down um, over the first few years and then level out over the, the last 25 years of a 30 year cycle. So you can adjust the flow, rate, the flow rates depending on, on what output, what heat output uh, you, you want to generate and how long uh, you want the uh, the rock to to generate heat for. So said we can flat for 30 years or 40 years, or we can run it in peak mode, and with the fluid going through faster and cooling the rock slightly more quickly at the beginning. But the heat output over you know the 30 year period is is going to be the same. So it's just a question of flow rate, and so this is also the answer to the question: How is temperature degradation? Uh, it just depends how fast you are producing. I mean, we're we're looking at a you know an asset of thirty plus years, uh, if not a hundred years, um, and like any asset that you spend a lot of money building, you look after it carefully. So if it requires a, a, a slightly a slower flow rate to ensure the longevity of the system, then that's what you do, knowing that you're not going to get as much heat out of the ground, but you're going to get that heat out of the ground over uh, more consistently over a longer period. 
if you want to destroy the acid, yeah, run the fluid through on the high pumps, super cool the rock, and and um, and basically destroy its ability to to generate heat. Um, so again, we get a lot of questions. People saying, well, look, the rock cools down; it's not going to work. Uh, but if you and people have done, if you actually do the maths and you look at the thermodynamics uh, properly, as countless organizations have done now, including TNO, um, they all come to the end with exactly the same, the same answers, that the system does work, it will work. It really just depends what are you designing for? What is the application that you want to design for on surface? And just your last answer is probably also the answer to the question, what is the downhole temperature? It just depends what you want to have on surface. Yes, yeah, exactly. Obviously, the, uh, the better the heat gradient, as with any geothermal project, the better the economics. That's, that's no different. Okay. Um, I think uh, to the thermal output in Gerritsried, you will say something in a few minutes. And then there is another question. How is the directed drilling and especially the connection to the wells between either and done? Yeah, so the um, the connection the connection of the two wells, uh, what we do is is we uh, we bring the wells to <coughs> within 150 meters of, of each other using um, conventional geosteering uh, techniques. And then we, we change the bottom hole assembly to what is called the magnetic ranging technology. So you have a transmitter in one side and a receiver on the other. Um, and so the, the, then you bring those two closer and closer to each other until they, until they intersect. Um, and the intersection is, is generally made at a, a slightly at an angle. So one is coming in under the other one rather than a, than a head-on collision. But the technology is, um, that part of the technology is, is used extensively in, uh, in the oil and gas industry. Okay. Um, the next question is, uh, what is your technology to locate the heat source? Oh, the technology to locate the heat source. Well, if you look at where, at all the projects that we're looking at at the moment, we're focusing on a few things. Um, but one of the, the most important is having is looking for projects in an area where there are already a lot of wells um, have been drilled, um, along with maybe some seismic data, 2D lines, 3D lines. Um, and uh, so if there are oil and gas wells that have been drilled, fantastic. If geothermal wells have already been drilled and uh, were unfortunately dry or uh, impermeable, as as is the case in Garrett Street, which is exactly how that project came about, then those are also attractive prospects for us as well. At the moment, um, and yeah, I mean, you, there are, you know, data sources where you, where you can look at general uh, heat gradient trends, um, though, those are available, but the best data comes from wells that have been drilled and, and, uh, and uh, drilled through the, the target zones that uh, we're looking at. Okay, the next question is, what is your working fluid? The working fluid uh, that we used in the uh, that is being used in the Everlight system is is water. It's 99% water with a with a few additives, um, such as uh, components to help reduce uh, the drag, uh, improve the f efficiency of the flow through the the system. Uh, there's also some material in there, the, the same material that we used in the drilling operation to seal the pipe, which which actually helps with any ongoing um, maintenance. So the the, the horizontal pipes, which are you know, drilled and completed with this rock pipe, are self-healing. But yeah, it's it's 99% water, um, and the intention is on the Garrett Street project is is to use a water-based uh, working fluid as well. Okay. The next question we have: What is the initial formation temperature, and what is the production temperature at the Canada site? So the, the downhole temperature in uh, in Canada is is around 70 degrees centigrade. Uh, the the surface temperature, um, as as predicted, is around 58. 
the the difference between the two uh, depends largely on the on the flow rate. So, and, and I can give you an example on that. So, if you, if you had a um, a downhole temperature of say 130, 140, and the only thing you needed the heat for was was a, a heating network which had an inlet temperature of 70 and an outlet temperature of 40, well then you'd run the fluid through a lot faster. Uh, maybe at 120 liters a second, you'd bring the surface temperature, maybe uh, you'd come out at about maybe 85, 90 degrees, so that it was close to you needed for the heat network. But if you wanted to take that same 100 downhole, 130, 140 degrees, and generate electricity, well, then you'd move the fluid through much more slowly so that your temperature on surface was, was maybe 100, 120 degrees, which would work better in your ORC systems. So again, it depends um, on what your downhole conditions are and what your surface application is. The two are built and integrated together so that they last for you know, the duration of the, the 30 to 100 year life of the asset. Okay, then there is a question to the fluid. We already answered. Does the thermal side siphon effect rely on making vacuum in the circulation pipe? No. No. You you can. Um, I mean, everybody's seen how a, a thermal siphon works. Um, again, you, it's just the density, the difference in densities of the of the fluids. And once you, you we do we do have to have an initial pump. Obviously, you, if the system is empty, has no fluid after it's drilled, then you need a small pump to charge the system, and then the the fluid needs to be given uh, time to begin to heat up. Um, so then, exactly as we did on the Everlight system, we ran with the pump uh, for the first 24 hours, and then once we were we did the emergency shutdown. Um, we reopened the valves without the pump and it, it started to flow by itself. Okay, did, did you do a circulation test at the Evil Light site in Canada? Yes, yeah, we did multiple um, circulation tests, um, multiple pressure tests, and those, and we were using it as a, as a test laboratory for new ideas and new concepts um, as, as well. Did you see any temperature reduction here? Yes, um, the temperature reduction is exactly in line with uh, what we predicted. Um, so again, it matches the thermodynamic models um, exactly within 2% of what we predicted. Thanks. There is a question. Do you know investigations on the improvement of energy output of a closed loop geothermal system developed by Professor Wolf from Berlin in 2008? Am I, am I aware of the project? Yes. Yes, yes. We uh, were made aware of that project uh, very early on. And there is another interesting question. What is the temperature of the fluid at your injection wellhead and production wellhead? Um, it really it depends um, on a number of different factors. So <clears throat> it depends how much heat is extracted from uh, the, uh, the application, whether it's a heating network or an ORC system. Um, obviously, we need to maintain the thermosiphon. There needs to be a, a certain temperature differential between the two. That temperature will vary slightly depending on the application. Um, in the case of Everlight, we, because we're not using the heat at the moment, so we put it through a, a cooling system uh, to, to bring the inlet temperature down again. But the inlet temperature um, will, will vary depending on the, uh, the application and obviously the location. Here another comment. Thank you. Great answers. And the next question is: Do you have a technical design game principle already in order to determine the distance between horizontal pipes? Can this estimation procedure already be quantified? 
Yes, so that, that is all built into uh, our, our models. It's also um, part of our intellectual property. So, so we have figured out what the spacing needs to be between the, um, the, the, the horizontal pipes to ensure there's no degradation or interference between the, the pipes. And, and so each individual pipe as, as, as a separate part of the radiator um, doesn't interfere with any other part of the radiator. So we're not causing any unnecessary uh, cooling of uh, rocks um, you know, between, between pipes. So yes, there, there is an optimum, there's a minimum distance between pipes that we've calculated. Um, and beyond, beyond that, um, there really isn't, it really isn't to space the pipes beyond that, uh, beyond that, that side. Um, and I'm more than happy to share, you know, some of those detailed models and the thermodynamic models under uh, appropriate confidentiality agreements. Um, but those are an integral part of our, our design and our intellectual property. Yes. Just to mention, uh, the whole recording will be available next week on the Enerchange YouTube channel. And we have another question. Are the currently working systems commercially viable? What's the payout time? Uh, good. Well, we don't. Um, the first system we built is, is the one in Canada. We, we now have a a growing pipeline of commercial projects. Um, the first one that we expect to, to drill is, is the one in Garrett Street. Um, and we hope to have that one um, operational by the, by the next year. Um, the economics on the first, uh, the first system in Garrett Street are uh, challenging uh, because there are all sorts of new things that uh, need to be done and built and learned from. Uh, the longer term uh, prospects in, in Germany, though, are extremely attractive. Um, and uh, I have a couple of slides where, I'll, where, where we can talk about that. There is another question. What market are you looking for? Put another way, is the heat market lucrative enough for you? Yes. Yeah, we're looking at um, heat markets and also electricity markets. The heat markets, particularly in, in Northern Europe, um, so we're very interested in, in cities, locations where ex existing heat networks exist, which are currently being fed by fossil fuels, whether that's the exhaust from coal-fired plants or lignite plants. Um, so we're extremely interested in looking at uh, opportunities to uh, replace those fossil fuel plants plants into, um, into existing heating networks. So there are obviously several locations in, uh, in Germany uh, that we're interested in. There are also, uh, there's a lot of interest in the Netherlands as well, um, in, in heat. And, and then in Paris, of course, you, you have a beautiful network, which is fed by um, the, the aquifer, the Dogger aquifer, which has been running for years and years and years. Um, but the, there's interest in expanding that, that network in Paris, uh, but the dogger isn't capable. So you know, we're looking at possibilities of, uh, of going down, looking at uh, deeper horizons, less permeable horizons uh, that, that may be able to feed that. So the economics actually work extremely well uh, for heat networks. Um, probably the best economics are combined heat and power projects, especially in places like Germany, which, which offer um, attractive in tariffs um, at, at the moment. Thanks for this answer and all the others also. Um, we have another question. If you if you take other fluids with, with low boiling temperatures, probably can generate steam at the surface. Yeah, I don't disagree um, with the, uh, the person asking the, the question and um, in any in any heat exchanger, research is always um, ongoing about what the working fluids should be within within inside the system. Um, and in terms of that research, uh, we we are no different from from any other company uh, building and managing uh, heat exchangers. And uh, that's really all I'm comfortable saying at the moment. Okay, I think we should go on now. Um, we are beyond our time, but, but we said also that we will continue.
to go on with the presentations and we'll have some further questions later on. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, very quick overview on the uh, on the project in, in Garrett Street. Um, if you're familiar with the area around Munich, um, a whole series of doublets, uh, traditional hydrogeothermal doublets, have been drilled successfully. And, and Munich um, is probably further advanced than, than any other city in Germany in terms of its use of uh, geothermal heat for district heating. Um, such was the, the success in and around Munich um, that attempts were made to look for an extension of that permeability further to, to the south. Um, but eventually the, the permeability started to decline. And, um, some dry wells were, were drilled. Um, so, and this is how we arrived at the, the opportunity in, uh, in Garrett Three. So the license area um, was originally set up by a company called NX. Uh, they drilled a well in 2013, um, a second well or side track in 2017, but both of these were unfortunately dry. They found good heat and we approached them uh, last year with the idea of working with them to make use of all the data and the knowledge that they have uh, that they had built, uh, excellent community relations that they built as well, and look at a way of reusing that knowledge to, to build an Evolute uh, system. So, uh, NX had prepared two well pads. The first one they was where they drilled the, uh, the side track, but there was a second well pad which was prepared but, but never used. So, th this, is, this is the focus of our investigations at, at the moment. Um, this is the, the license area and the approximate subsurface shape of the Evolute systems that, that we're planning to drill. Um, and if you look at where this well pad is here, Garrett Street is, is down to the southeast, about six kilometers away. And these different cars that you, you see here are all the, the heating networks that, that don't exist but that are planned. So if we, uh, once we get the heat out of the ground and, and give the, uh, the municipalities confidence, then they will start to build out these, uh, these heat networks. Um, so the project is a combined uh, heat and power project, supplying whatever heat uh, we can, and then whatever excess heat that's uh, generated will be used for uh, electricity generation. And uh, Garrett Street is an example of uh, several projects that we've got around the world that have all come about on the on the back of uh, dry uh, <coughs> traditional geothermal wells. Um, it's something that's extremely attractive for both us and the potentially for the developer. Um, it saves us a couple of years and and it helps the developer um, leverage the investment that they they have already made. So we bring out our projects in in different parts of the world um, with a very very uh, similar situations where dry wells have been drilled um, and uh, a lot of great data, but unsure what to do with them. So the, the project team that we've we've put together on this has has been quite uh, extensive. Uh, in addition to all of the people uh, that are working on this from ever, um, and a whole series of people uh, are contributing. Uh, Bailey Schwartz is our lead engineer and project manager, probably is spent most time on the on the project. Um, Ryan uh, Mitchell has been involved and then Stephen Longfield on the uh, on the geology side. Um, we've also had um, tremendous support. I can't really can't under understate this um, it, from from both Robert and Andreas from NX who, who've been absolutely fantastic in helping us uh, get to the uh, get the project to where it is. Without their help um, Frankly, the project would not would uh, would not exist. Um, we also have a, a partnership with Shell, and so Shell seconded a uh, gentleman by the name of Mark Hodder, one of their senior well engineers, who's been helping us with the uh, the well design and well planning, and running a whole series of RFIs uh, with local German uh, drilling companies and, and contractors. Um, then we've had additional support from uh, local. Um, drilling engineering companies, um, and then 
the other two companies that really helped us um, tremendously, GOT uh, near Karlsruhe and, uh, and, and Gecko near in uh, Augsburg. Both of those companies have actually been with us uh, right from the beginning in, in advising us um, in how to uh, how to approach the geothermal market. So we've had a technical uh, program ongoing. We've looked at the geology. We've looked at the the drilling issues. We've looked at all the uh, the facilities uh, requirements. And to date, you know, this is this is our sort of progress uh, status. Um, and you can see here the intention is to start drilling either later this year or early next year with a view to having that first ever loop and, and up and running by uh, the fourth quarter next year, at which point uh, we will then start work on the on the second ever loop. So the project calls for a, a total of four ever loops. And then beyond uh, beyond Carrot Street, we're looking at other um, projects in Bavaria, which are where we will hope to uh, improve on the initial Garrett Street project, uh, improve the economics, and then move on to larger projects. So, and this is one of the, the challenges we face with the, the first Garrett Street project. So the, the returns are not spectacular, but the unlevered returns here are about 4.1%. This is before any grants uh, or, or uh, project financing is, is considered. Um, so the the grant applications are uh, in the, are underway and will be important to to get this uh, this first project off the ground. But beyond that, leveraging off that knowledge and that experience, we we expect to make uh, dramatic improvements in the economics um, through second and third projects uh, in and around Bavaria. Um, in term in terms of total investment, you know we think there's invest investment potential of you know, maybe a, more than a than 100 billion in Bavaria alone. And our overall vision for, for Germany, um, you know, which runs in stages based on geology and, and heat gradients, but eventually, uh, because of the way closed loop works uh, and the fact that it can operate within reason almost anywhere, um, is to be off, able to offer geothermal as a truly scalable um, energy source uh, that, that can be delivered in, in any part of Germany. So the potential thermal capacity, the potential employment impacts within Germany, and also the reduction in, in greenhouse gas emissions has is is quite is potentially quite substantial. Jochen, thank you very much. That was uh, all I wanted to cover. I'm obviously uh, very happy to, to take more questions. Okay, thank you very much. It was really very interesting and also the intensive information about Gerrit Sieg, what you are doing here. Um, I'm just looking back to the bunch of, of the question which came up to now. How do you ensure proper thermal coupling between the rock and the well if the whole geometries are not circular, e.g. broken or washed out? Yes, and I think um, it's, it's a good point. Um, we we haven't experienced uh, on Everlight. We we didn't have the, this problem. We don't expect to have this problem in in Garrett Street either, um, and that's simply because we're we're sealing the rock as we drill it. And um, in in a typical oil and gas situation, right? You, you desperately or or, or in, 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 in sorry, in a geothermal situation, you don't you desperately don't want to do any damage to the the permeability. Um, and the porosity of the of the reservoir because that that is the source of your energy and so there tends in those situations there tends to be washed out because you you're flowing um, the fluids um, you're trying to protect the the rock and the permeability in our case we're actually it's the complete opposite trying to um, not not destroy the permeability but basically to block it to block the pore space to block the permeability because all we're interested in is the is the conductivity of the rock not the fluid content of the rock so by drilling in this way we we actually will have uh, and that's certainly the experience born out in everlight we, we will have far fewer 
washouts um, in, the, in the drilling operation. The next question is also connected uh, to this. How do you seal and stabilize the rock? Do you have processes in place to check over time? Yes, the, the, um, again, the, the exact details on the rock pipe technology, more than happy to share under a, a non-disclosure agreement. The, um, uh, the, the rock is, uh, as I say, we're using some of the, the this uh, rock pipe sealing technology in the, in the fluid as well. So that seals over time. Sorry, there was a second part of that question. What, what was that, Jochen? How do you control it? Uh, do you have processes in place to check? Yeah, over yes. Time? Yeah, yeah, of course. So the volume of fluid inside a inside an Evolute system is, is about the size of an uh, Olympic swimming pool. So it's uh, it's it's measurable. It's it's a large volume of fluid, um, but obviously it's because we're not flowing from the reservoir and it's a completely closed loop system. So we're continually monitoring. The volume of fluid in there. So, if there are any losses um, in the system, we, you know, we have an indication of that um, immediately. But, but what, what will you do then when when you have any loss? The, um, as I said, the losses are if they are coming, they're going to come from any sort of permeability uh, in the in the horizontal sections. But as I said. Um, it's a bit like a plumber, right? When a, a plumber is trying to figure out where the leak is in your in your system, right? He doesn't take the whole house apart. He just puts the fluid inside the system, which chases it through and finds the leak and and, uh, and seals it. And so the the rock pipe technology works in the same way. And as I said, that sealant is actually in the working fluid consistently. So uh, based on our experience in uh, in Ever over six months, um, we don't foresee any major issues in terms of uh, leak offs or losses in the in the system. The next question, I think you already answered regarding the German side. What is the temperature at depth distance between the two wells and the depth production foreseen? I think this was already mentioned. Yeah, the length the length of the laterals. Uh, will in, in the full commercial system, in, in the case of Garrett Street, will be around uh, 5,000 meters. Okay, the next question, how do you run casing in the horizontal multilateral sections? No, we're not. No, we're not running casing. You, you have no casing here. Yeah, no casing. The next question, what size vertical hole diameter would be required for a typical electricity generation system? So what we the horizontal the horizontal sections in Garrett Street are going to be drilled with eight and a half inch. So the the, the casing um, you know through the intermediate casing point is going to be around nine and five eighths to get an eight and a half inch bit through there. So you can you can you can reverse that back from there to figure out what the uh, the bit size will be in the vertical sections. Um, and depending on this, the state and the, and the locality and the protection that we need to make of the groundwater, then we're, you know, either running with uh, two, three, four casing strings, but um, down to the intermediate casing point. Thanks. We have another question about the thermosiphon effect. How do you control the flow rate if circulation relies on thermosiphon principle? Well, the, the beautiful thing about the thermosiphon is is that you can, um, if you're running the fluid through on thermosiphon for 24 hours, you can actually close it for two hours, three hours, four hours, five hours, six hours. In theory, anything up to 24 hours, open the valves and, and then it will flow again. So, um, and this is what I was talking, when I was talking before about shape being able to shape the output to follow a demand profile. Um, so if you can just imagine a base load of 10 megawatts, uh, a system that has got a base load capacity that can run 24 hours a day, that gives you 240 uh, megawatt hours. You can adjust the flow rate um, 
to either deliver less than the 10 megawatt capacity for several hours and then increase the flow rate above that. And it really is just a question of, of opening and closing the valves and choking the valves to, to change it. But the thermosiphon effect will work uh, down to a very low flow rate <clears throat> and up to a, a certain extent before it would require uh, an incremental pump, maybe maybe two or three times the, uh, the base load capacity. Here is another remark to this topic. I'm surprised that the thermosiphon works as the density between hot and cold water is not that much, but of course it worked in the pilot. What pressure differentials were created by the density differences? Uh, good question. I, I don't have that data to, to hand. If you can find out um, who's, who's asking the question, I'd be more than happy to get that information to you. Yes, okay. I send it to you. Is the Canada Ever site still operating today? Yes, just like you can just send it to my personal email address. It's fine. It's on the screen now. Do you have monitoring systems to check the corrosive salt dissolution during the life cycle to be able to replace the fluid in the closed loop and protect the equipment? Um, well, the system is completely closed and completely sealed, um, so <clears throat> we're not dealing with salt water. Great answers to questions. Thank you. So, in summary, is it true that you can optimize the subsurface and the surface facility to fit the use case, and thus this is the basis of your system being scalable and economical globally? So it is an optimization exercise and not a science problem? Okay. Correct. Yeah, it's, you're absolutely right. I, I couldn't have put it better myself. And I, our biggest risk, I mean, the biggest risk in a traditional geothermal project is finding the aquifer, finding the fault with the flow. Um, our biggest risk is, is the cost of the drilling operation. So it's, it's a shift and we are, seeking to optimize the uh, the integrated design between what's available below ground and what the demand is above ground and how that demand shift and adjust over over time yeah so the whole system has to be has to be designed um, as, as an integral whole are you seeking support from the eu innovation fund yes for the Garrett Street project, we're, we're seeking um, support from the uh, Innovation Fund. Yes. Okay. We're also if, if we're also interested in um, companies who may be interested in investing in the Garrett Street project. Um, and if that's something that may be of interest to you, then please uh, send me an email. Then we start with the questions which came after the end of your presentation. Can you give some information about your latest license award in Hannover? <laughs> well, we're, we're still celebrating. Um, so we we have made um, a number of license applications in in, uh, in Germany, um, and uh, the, the the license, the Hannover license, was uh, award, awarded a few days ago. So now the um, the real work begins. Is, is it directly in Hannover or is it because there is also this license of the BGR uh, related to the Guinnesses project? Yeah, no, this, this one is, uh, it, remember, it's actually very close uh, to, um, to Hannover. And the license was uh, designed and applied for specifically to support the, uh, the heat network in Hannover. Question to Gerrit Reed. At this step, mechanical borehole integrity, in particular for the horizontal section, must be a critical aspect. How do you ensure the wells remain mechanically stable? The simple answer to that is that uh, we maintain a slightly positive pressure in the, in the working fluid, and water being an incompressible fluid acts, adds to the integrity of the of the rock of the well bore, 
uh, we're not producing anything from the rock other than, than heat. We're not taking any fluid or uh, debris out in, the, in, in there because we're not actually producing anything from the, uh, the rock. So we expect well integrity to be uh, better and longer lasting than anything similar in a you know, conventional geothermal or oil and gas project. Thank you, Robert. Here is another question to Hannover. The people from there are very interested. Can you elaborate on your recently granted license in near Hannover, uh, Kleefeld? How specific are yeah, there? We'll, Do you have any partners there? We, um, again, the license was literally awarded this week. Um, so it's very, very early stages of the, uh, of the discussions. Um, we are interested in the area because of the heat network. Uh, we think the, uh, the geology is good. We know that there have been other uh, projects and ideas to look at geothermal in Hanover, but, but um, these have not been successful because um, perhaps because of a lack of permeability or the risk of finding the aquifer was considered too high. So the demand, we know the demand is there uh, and we know the geology potentially is, is very good, which is why we were attracted to the area in the first place. And it, it's also an important part, uh, and it's a good example of our licensing strategy and our partnership strategy. We, we are not trying to compete with uh, traditional geothermal projects. If you've got a, a great aquifer, um, if you've got a, a, a great uh, flowing heat source, then fantastic. Where we're looking is on the edges of that. Um, looking for where the permeability pinches out or looking in areas where there is no known permeability, but there is still demand for, for heat. So we're trying to, if you think about traditional geothermal being applicable in maybe five to 10% of the, you know, the world's land surface, uh, we're, just, we're just interested in the other 90%. Here is another question. In the lateral loop, are the pressures slightly overbalanced above hydrostatic gradient pressure at the injection point of the lateral and the balance uh, below hydrostatic at the lateral exit? Does this create the potential for mechanical hole load stress and fluid losses versus inflow? Um, not, not to my understanding, no. Um, if you think about water being an incompressible fluid, um, and, and we've, we've actually, and I'm not sure this is answering the question, but it, it, from a health and safety perspective, it's, it's certainly important. But if somebody was to reverse a truck over the wellhead um, and expose you know, the whole system, what would actually happen? Um, very, very little. There would be a small flowing of water. And, and then the, the hydrostatic head would balance it, it out. Because again, we're not flowing anything from the reservoir. The only pressure in there is, is pressure either from the thermosiphon or from you know, the pressure, the positive pressure that we're, we're maintaining on the, on the fluids. A similar to the question we had before, if you use no casing, how do you avoid hole collapse? What types of pipes you're using? The rock pipe technology um, is is part of our intellectual property, um, and uh, it's was one of the main things that we wanted to test on the uh, Everlight. And again, if you want to send me an email, um, and we'd be happy to set a put a non disclosure agreement in place and to share more detailed technical information with you on Everlight and the way our rock pipe technology works. The next question, do you think ever technology could be efficient in high temperature dry rock? Is there any figures relating downhole temperature with amount of fluid required? The, um, our focus at the moment is, is very much on the, on the sedimentary layers. Um, so that's the, uh, the ranging technology <coughs> that we that we use to internet, intersect the wells uh, will work up to around 180, maybe 200 degrees. Um, beyond that, uh, then you know, we, we would need some different technology or, or a different way of, of drilling them. Um, so at the moment, we 
the, the market in, in the sedimentary rocks um, in Germany and the Netherlands um, and also in France and in Italy. Um, if that's, that's where we're focusing on at the moment. Here is another question related. What type of mud is used during drilling and how to avoid its mixed with the rock pipe? It was mentioned that the rock pipe is applied while drilling. Yeah, the, the, the rock pipe is, is a fluid. It's, it's a chemical process that is an integral part of the, uh, of the drilling mud. So that was something that we experimented with extensively during the drilling operation in, uh, in Everlight. Um, and we will take those lessons and apply those to the, uh, the project in, in Garrett 3. But we, we, apart from that, we're using you know, normal drilling um, technologies, some muds, um, with, and as with any drilling mud, it depends on the rock that you're, you're drilling, what the geology is, um, and then you add certain additives to the mud to, to make uh, the drilling easier, to protect, protect the, uh, the well, well more integrity. Um, so on and so forth. Uh, so the actual final design of the mud system will depend on the local conditions. Obviously, one of the, the, the great things about working in Garrett 3 is that we have some offset wells with a lot of that data and a lot of that experience, um, which, which we will use in, uh, in drilling Garrett 3. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, is drilling cost the biggest risk to meeting your economic goals? Yes, simple answer, yes. <laughs> okay, I love simple answers. We can proceed. Um, how dependent are the economics on these closed loop radiator projects to downhole temperatures? Yes, definitely. Um, the better the heat gradient, so the the, uh, the higher the temperature down hole, and the closer it is to surface, the less drilling that we have to do to to get there. Uh, the better the, the better the economics, without a doubt. So, and uh, for sure. So there are a number of parameters that affect the economics. One is certainly the heat gradient. The second one is the thermal conductivity of the rock. <coughs> so. Thermal conductivity is is, uh, is important. It's another reason why it's good to focus on the sedimentary layers uh, like sandstones and limestones, dolomites, because they tend to have a higher thermal conductivity. That, that's that's also important. And then the the drillability of the the rock. What is the rate of penetration? Because we're going to spend a lot of time drilling thousands of meters of uh, horizontal sections. So the rate of penetration that we can get. At the rock base uh, is is also another key key parameter. The next question is: Ever good for military bases? Yes, absolutely. Um, we had a whole series of what they call behind the fence projects um, because the system is is black star capable. It offers um, resilience uh, as well as a, as a power source. So. It is proving extremely att attractive to uh, military bases as well. Is there any seismicity induced by operating the system? No. Simple answer. Thanks for the shared knowledge. Nice weekend. No answer necessary. Density multiplied by heat capacity, volume, and a differential temperature. Do you have a differential temperature of about 30 degrees and a volume of 100 liters per second? How does that get to tens of megawatt? Yeah, so that's that's certainly um, a thermodynamics question, um, and. Uh, if, if the individual wants to, to write to me again, we can we can share some more detailed information about the way the thermodynamics uh, work. But they take a number of factors into account, some of which I have already shared. Um, and uh, there are yeah nine or ten key factors which determine the thermal output. Um, and again, depending on what you're trying to do on surface, you you adjust and you optimize those to to meet your uh, surface. Um, requirements. 
Okay. If there is no casing, are you using a liner or is it open hole completion? It's open hole completion. Okay, simple answer. What main business model are you looking for with Everloop technology? Licensing to geothermal companies. Uh, it's that's a really good question. So when we first started the company, we 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 were thinking ourselves more as a as a technology licensing company, and then everybody everybody told us that it wouldn't work. Um, so they weren't interested in the license. So we decided that we had to be a geothermal company ourselves. So we certainly intend to build the first few ourselves. But once we once we prove the technology and people begin to realise that this is scalable and can work anywhere in the world, then um, we're going to need a lot of help to, to scale it massively. And at that point, um, yeah, we'll switch back to, I imagine, to more of a, a licensing model, uh, just simply so that, that we can make this available in as many places as, in the world as possible, as soon as possible, so that we have a chance to, to change the world and, and reverse climate change. Thank you. And here is the last question. How do you avoid flow going preferentially through one or only a few laterals? Yes, it's it's, um, it's it's another question that, that, that comes up very often. And um, if you if you play around with it yourself and you try to push <clears throat> fluid through uh, more fluid through two pipes um, or through one pipe rather than two, balance itself out automatically, naturally. So it's not it's not a big issue. Okay, thanks. I will uh, send you the, the open questions, then you can answer them. And we can proceed now for the with the announcements. We will have a new webinar in the next week. We stay here in Bavaria oh. and we will have um, a look on the geothermal potential, which is presented by Dr. Kai Zoseder from the Technical University from Munich. And further announcements, um, we are planning actually to have the Invest Geothermal Conference in September and also the Praxis Forum Geothermy in October as presence events. We're just looking for the adequate locations. So for me, it's to wish you all a very nice weekend. Thanks for being here. Thanks to Robert for this very good presentation with lots of questions he answered. And looking forward to see you next week with the next webinar. Bye-bye. Jochen, thank you very much.